This video lecture is entitled Three Motifs for Making Ethical Decisions. This video lecture is part of the course Christian Worldview and Biblical Decision Making at the East Asia School of Theology. During the past few lessons, we've been looking at some different ethical theories, including consequentialist ethics, principle or rule-based ethics, and virtue ethics. Today, we're going to shift from theory to practice. In this lesson, we're going to look at some tools that can help us in making ethical decisions that are in agreement with biblical teaching. Now, historically, there have been three uh, methods or motifs that Christians have used in making ethical decisions. These three motifs are the deliberative motif, the prescriptive motif, and the relational motif. Now, typically, when Christians use these motifs, they don't usually use all three motifs at once. They usually use one or at most two of these motifs at the same time. And they often will um, downplay or not give as much attention to the other one or other two motifs. So these are not purest motifs that we're talking about, but they do offer us a helpful framework as, as we go up to help us to clarify um, the major elements that go into any distinctly Christian and responsible ethical choice or set of choices. So today we'll look at each of these three motifs and then we'll evaluate their pluses and minuses. The first motif we'll look at is the deliberative motif. Representatives of the deliberative approach include Thomas Aquinas, Otto Harnack, and Paul Ramsey. According to the deliberative motif, every human being, not just the Christian, has the God-given capacity to make rational, moral judgments. So that is the basic um, foundation for the deliberative motif. So the deliberative motif is based on rational thought and it emphasizes rational decision-making. So here are some important claims and implications of the deliberative motif. Ethics has a universal scope and significance that goes beyond merely sectarian and religious commitments. We are not just telling the Christian community or calling the Christian community to live ethically in the face of the larger world outside. We are called to be salt and light by sharing the gospel but also by encouraging all people to live according to the divine design God has created us to live by. Therefore, biblical ethics isn't just for Christians. It is universal, meaning it's true for all people at all times, in all places, and in all circumstances. For example, an automobile is designed to run at sea level up to a certain elevation, after which the engine will fail. 
This is why cars cannot run properly in the high passes of the Rocky Mountains and will be completely useless at Mount Everest Base Camp in the Himalayas. Another implication of deliberative ethics is that while helpful and true, biblical morality is not sufficient to deal with all of the contemporary ethical problems we face. Consequently, we need innate moral reason to help us discern the ethical way to deal with many current issues that are not addressed in the scriptures. The fact of the matter is, the Bible has little or nothing to say in any direct or definite way about human cloning, certain kinds of stem cell research, the search for extraterrestrial life, etc. If we demand that the Bible speaks on every subject imaginable, then we may get into some trouble. But if we say that God speaks on every subject, then we have to also agree that he must, um, that we must use at least some significant measure of human reason and deliberation for discernment concerning any of these ambiguous and complex matters. The reason for this is that the Bible was written for a specific purpose and never had as its goal to speak to every possible contingency that would rear its head in the days and years and centuries ahead. The Bible is authoritative on the matters about which it speaks, but it is less important for deciding, for example, what is the best way to extract hydrogen and oxygen from a liter of water, and how much of each you will wind up in the, at the end of, the, of that process. As surprising as it, as it may, may sound to some of you, that is a question for the practice of chemistry and not, so it's a practice for, um, it's a question for the practice of chemistry to answer and decidedly not for scripture to answer. Another implication of deliberative ethics is that Christian ethics, in particular, is ultimately an ethics for the well-being of humanity in general. Again, we wish for the well-being of all and not just selfishly for our own community. We call people to ethical living, not to limit or make their lives miserable, but to offer them the kind of life they were made for and ultimately long for. So let's reflect on the deliberative motif. <clears throat> there are some positive aspects of the deliberative motif. Um, and one of these is that the Bible affirms that some things can be known about God from nature alone. Um, and we see this in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 and following, where it talks about how um, God's glory and nature have been made manifest in what he has created so that men are without excuse. There does seem to be a universal moral sensibility present. Okay. Another positive aspect of the deliberative motif is that there does seem to be a universal moral sensibility present within all human beings throughout time that lends credibility to this ethical approach. For example, what makes us want to be good? So here we have a, a picture of a man in a subway, and he sees this single mother or this mother struggling to carry up a her baby 
and her baby stroller up some steps. So this man is wrestling. Should I help this woman or not? And so that is a question that not only Christians would wrestle with, but even non-Christians would wrestle with that question, which again suggests that there does seem to be a universal moral sensibility present within all humans. So that's another positive aspect of the deliberative motif. Unfortunately, there are a few negative aspects to the deliberative motif. One of these is that it tends to overestimate the goodness of human rationality and underestimate the corrupting influences of human sin upon the rational and moral enterprise. So whereas we can agree that many of us would feel um, an urging within us to help the woman, the mother, who, had, who is struggling to carry her baby and her baby stroller up steps, it's also true that the deliberative motif tends to overestimate the goodness of human rationality, and that it also tends to underestimate the corrupting influences of human sin. And we see this all the time beginning in childhood. You know, a mother will, or a father will, or even a teacher will say to two children, share your toys. But what often happens? Well, that often doesn't happen because one child will be selfish and say, no, I want to play with the, these toys now. They're mine. And so we have the corrupting influence of human sin at play. The deliberative motif also divorces ethics from the larger worldview framework upon which it largely depends. And this method of doing ethics, that is the deliberative motif, tends to produce a minimalist, sometimes called thin ethic, in, relate, in contrast to the robust or thick ethic, ethic of Christian life and thought. So the deliberative motif has a lot of good, good aspects to it, but it can tend to lead to a minimalist approach to ethics. Let's look at the prescriptive motif. Representatives of the prescriptive approach to ethics include John Calvin and Carl Henry. So one of the um, aspects of prescriptive motif is that the sources of ethical understanding and moral judgment is found in the laws, prescription, and principles revealed to us by God in scripture. And so that's the basic foundation for prescriptive ethics. Now, here are some um, implications of prescriptive ethics. One of these is adherence to principles. One of the ways this is worked out is through the idea that there are basic principles that essentially lie behind all moral actions and decisions. Those principles are expressed concretely in the various prohibitions and prescriptions given to us in the Bible. Our job is to find any principle behind the concrete expression in time and place and then apply these prescriptions or principles in the contemporary situation we are facing. Incidentally, throughout the history of the church, this has been the primary way of doing Christian ethics. 
most believers, if not all, do this kind of moral reasoning from scriptural examples somewhat intuitively anyway, without even being consciously aware of it. The Bible is seen, okay. Here, okay, the, the prescriptive motif also advocates an adherence to codes. Here, the idea is that there are concrete courses of action that we can glean from the pages of scripture that pertain to virtually every aspect of life, any and every question we have about what to do in a given situation can be answered by referring to some sort of scriptural example. It is not uncommon to use a combination of both specific moral codes, such as do not withhold aid if it is in your power to give, and a more general ethical principle, such as be kind to one another to try and discern what moral course of action to take. So that's a basic description of the prescriptive motif. Now, let's look at some positive aspects of the prescriptive motif. And one of these aspects is shown here in this slide. The Bible is seen as centrally important and authoritative in making ethical decisions that are pleasing to God. The tendency to leave God out of the equation is theoretically avoided here by making his word the central player in the process of moral discernment. So because the Bible is centrally important, that brings God into, into the conversation about what is ethically proper. Another positive aspect of prescriptive ethics is that this understanding of ethics makes it possible for the average Christian believer to understand and fulfill the moral will of God. The complexity of some ethical theories makes them seem almost useless and inaccessible to the average layperson. What good is an ethical theory if no one can understand it enough to actually be able to live it out? And so that highlights how the prescriptive approach to ethics actually makes it possible for the average Christian believer to understand and fulfill the moral will of God. Now, there are some negative aspects to the prescriptive approach. And one of these is that history shows that this approach has an unfortunate tendency to lead towards legalism, the reliance on rules and regulations rather than on God through his Holy Spirit and his designly be bestowed rationality to bring moral discernment. Focusing on the rules and principles of scripture tends to ignore the broader Christian foundation for ethics, namely the triune God and the overarching biblical drama of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. In other words, we lose sight of why we must obey God's commands. We forget that we are here to please him, and not simply to fulfill a rigid set of rules and regulations. Matters of the heart and motivation, that is, the whys of ethics, play a central role in becoming a truly ethical and virtuous person. If our focus remains on the rules, we will inevitably lose sight of the forest because of all the trees. <clears throat>
Another negative aspect of the prescriptive approach is that some moral issues are extremely complex and require more than a simple appeal to scripture. It is sometimes tempting to find a chapter and verse to appeal to on a given subject and then later realize that there are other portions of scripture that could also be brought to bear on a subject that are potentially of equal authority on the matter. So, how can one decide in such cases? For example, when it comes to organ transplant, how do you decide which patients will receive organs? There, because there are no specific biblical passages that offer clear-cut guidance on this particular question. We can draw principles, but sometimes we may actually see several different principles that apply to this issue. In addition, scripture must carefully interpret, must be carefully interpreted, and some of its prohibitions and prescriptions, like dis the discussion concerning haircut and head covering in 1 Corinthians 11, for example, are not as straightforward and simple to understand and obey as they may appear at first glance. So that's the prescriptive motif. Let's look at the relational motif. The relational motif is um, represented by Karl Barth and Stanley Hallowas and many others. Now, the key principle in the relational motif is this. The key factor in making moral choices involves our relational connection with God and one another more than adherence to impersonal laws and regulations. The Bible is important for ethical decisions insofar as it provides inspirational historical examples and reflections of how other godly men and women made moral choices based on their intimacy with God and other people. Okay, so this is what the relational motif is based on. So let's reflect on the relational motif and evaluate its positive and negative aspects. Now, the, relation, the relational motif is correct to remind us that we can only avoid the trap of legalism when our ethical choices flow from an intimate and growing walk with God. This view rightly reminds us that ethics cannot be divorced from our walk with God and the overall Christian narrative network framework or worldview without becoming autonomous and making God and the Christian worldview irrelevant to discovering and exhibiting a genuinely moral way of life. The relational motif is also right in emphasizing that it is out of a person's character that genuinely moral decisions arise and not out of isolated choices alone. And just like the other two motifs, there are some negative aspects to the relational motif. The first of these is the ever-present danger of moral subjectivism and relativism. This is perhaps the greatest problem with this view. It tends to put way too much power in the sinful self as the arbiter of ethical living and then largely ignores the objective standards revealed to us through God's word. So this is a very negative aspect of the relational motif. Another negative aspect of the relational motif is the inadequacy of grounding character formation and ethical norms in the narrative community. Let me 
expand on this. If a community is itself unjust, how can we evaluate it from a transcendent basis of ethics? There must be something beyond the community to determine whether that community is morally just or not, as well as how close or far they are from the divine standard to which God calls them. Tim Keller uses a helpful example here to illustrate the problematic nature of only looking to the community to find moral guidance. He notes that in 11th century Europe, a man in the Viking community who has the desire to smash and kill as well as same-sex attraction would be encouraged to sublimate his same-sex desire and develop his propensity to smash and kill. Now, take that same man and place him in the progressive yuppie community of downtown New York. Which desire do you think he will be encouraged to express and develop? develop? And which desire do you think he would be discouraged from expressing and developing? It all depends on the community as well as the time and place he lives. Now, to alleviate the temptation to say contemporary New York is progressive and therefore enlightened in its views versus the views of 11th century Viking, let's place our, our Viking in the first century Roman army where both desires would be encouraged and deemed normal. Then place that same man in a Christian community of the second century. In the Christian community of the second century, neither of these desires would be encouraged. All of this should immediately alert us to the fact that our community is no more sufficient or finding our moral compass than the individual. Something more is needed if we are to find a proper set of evaluated criteria for determining what is right and what is wrong. So, one approach to take is modified prescriptivism. That is synthesizing and applying insight from all three motifs. And this is because our moral life cannot be rooted in commands and prohibitions alone, but must be grounded in the revealed character of the triune God and the biblical storyline and worldview. The biblical basis for discerning moral choices goes way beyond simple injunctions and sanctions because we can also learn much about ethics from other genres and portions of scripture. So the Ten Commandments offer us some very simple rules and yet at the same time, they are very profound. But at the same time, the Ten Commandments are not the sole source for um, finding moral guidance in the Christian tradition. And due to the inherent complexity and ambiguity present in many ethical dilemmas, we must also recognize the place that reason and rational deliberation still play in the ethical enterprise. The Bible calls this wisdom, that is the wise application of truth by a virtuous person in a complex moral situation. There is also a place for making ethical appeals to those around us who do not necessarily share in the assumptions and practices of our Christian worldview. 
Again, the appeal to common ground with all human beings is an important part of pursuing an ethical community life. And the proper motivation, power, and discernment for ethical living is grounded in the grace of God as it is given to us through salvation, the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, a growing Christ likeness, conversational prayer, and the accountability and guidance of the Christian community. Because the truth of the matter is, apart from God, we can do nothing truly moral. As Jesus himself taught us, apart from me, you can do nothing. So in today's lesson, we've looked at three different um, moral motifs. We've looked at the deliberative motif, we've looked at the prescriptive motif, and we've looked at the relational motif. And so I want to encourage you to reflect on these three motifs and to come to class ready to talk about these three motifs. So I look forward to seeing you in class. God bless.